first of all, let's talk about market conditions, client sentiment. How has it been? Because when you take a look at what your one of your main rivals in Asia, UBS, well, it announced 9% drop in revenues. It's difficult times. I was at the same conference in London, Morgan Stanley conference and, uh, conference, and were a bit surprised. So what I see is that um, uh, there is uh, actually more um, client activity than uh, end of last year. You know, if I look at the last quarter last year, so it's higher uh, this year. Uh, it's not at the levels that we saw at the beginning of 2018, but certainly the clients do a little bit more. And what um, obviously is positive for us is that, uh, you know, stock markets did well, so assets on the management have gone up. Uh, and part of our fees are, um, uh, you know, um, asset-based fees, and the other one are transaction-based fees. Well, what are you observing in terms of appetite for risk, given the uncertainty? We have the bond market now. Well, nobody knows how to make sense of it. Look, what we advised the clients end of last year is stay invested. Uh, uh, that was very, very positive for the clients. For, Where? For, for us. Stay invested in, in the equity markets. You know, if you saw December, of course, was a bloodbath, was, uh, was not good for... For us, for, for, for the clients. Uh, but our advice back then, end of December, was stay in, invested. And uh, of course, that's positive. We have discussions. I just come from Hong Kong and met some of the clients there uh, that ask us, you know, should we take some chips off the table uh, carefully? Uh, I think that's not a bad uh, idea because the first three months were extremely uh, positive in, in the stock markets. Um, if you look at the SP, it's the steepest rise uh, since 1990, uh, 1991. Um, so it's possible that you see a bit of uh, correction. Do you think the market has gone too far in predicting that the Fed will do more than one cut this year? Um, look, uh, it's a bit difficult these days to, um, to, uh, to see what the Fed plans to do because they change their mind um, quite often. Uh, you know, what we heard in December was something completely different than what we hear now. Um, what, what we assume is that um, there is a possibility that we see uh, another cut early um, 2020. Um, uh, and I couldn't really understand, you know, that Mr. Paul boxed him in for quite a long time. Due to the recent route that we saw, you announced some cuts. Where are these cuts being done for Julius Baer? Yeah, look, last year we had a fantastic, tremendous first half and then a much more difficult the second half. So we started some tactical cost measures already then. Now we do it more on a strategic basis. For example, we um, analyze the locations we have and uh, smaller locations that um, where we think is very difficult to make money or to grow. We have closed. We have closed three, three of them uh, already. Um, the, uh, Holland we, we closed in uh, Amsterdam, we closed uh, Panama, Peru. So we tried to do it a bit more strategic, and we also, also had some, uh, some headcount cuts. Now, when it comes to challenges, uh, that includes retaining talent, retaining uh, relationship managers. Recently, we saw an exodus of uh, senior relationship managers from Julius Baer to the likes of Pictet. Are, are you concerned that you're losing talent? Now, look, last year we um, hired 105 relationship managers net, so gross, that's a bigger number, and we lost six to Picte, so that's not a big problem. But going forward, I mean, there, there are concerns that perhaps uh, the former CEO, Boris Kolodi, may be poaching your senior RMs. Uh, it, it can't be good. It can't be a good feeling seeing your talent leave. Yeah, we had, as I mentioned, only very, very few people leaving, so they like our platform. Uh, I, I respect Pictet. It's, it's a good company. It's a good firm. They have a different plat platform than we. For example, here in, in Asia, you know, our platform is much more comprehensive, so uh, we don't fear them. Talk to us about your restructuring, because Julius Baer has been under quite a bit of scrutiny of late uh, by the regulator. What else can we expect? No, look, um, what I did uh, since I took uh, control uh, as a CEO is two things. Um, we uh, worked a bit on the legacy issues, and proof uh, point is that uh, we're able to finish the, the, the uh, DPA, uh, uh, the, uh, the Deferred Prosecution Agreement in the U.S. I think it's fantastic for us. So I want to tick them off uh, one by one. And the, the other thing is we have started, uh, you know, to increase the quality of our client data. We call it upgrade, and we'll continue to, to do that. And in terms of uh, plans for yourself, it's been 16 months since you took over as CEO of Julius Baer. How long do you think you'll be in this position? And when it comes to your board, yeah. is, uh, what succession plans might there be? Look, we will uh, have a new uh, chairman soon, uh, April 10. Uh, he will be elected. 
I know him since many, many years. We worked together at Credit Suisse. I think he is a very knowledgeable guy. I just presented the three-year strategy implementation plan, and um, uh, I really like um, my job, and I like w what I'm doing. Uh, when it comes to Asia, who would you consider as your top three competitors, and how do you yourself maneuvering and positioning? What's your strategic priorities so that you ensure that you remain in the top three? Look, in, in Asia, we're actually top five. Um, our main competitors are UBS, CS, uh, CD, HSBC. Um, uh, we have a very, very comprehensive platform. And maybe you've seen last year, we continue to, uh, to invest also into Thailand, into, uh, into Japan. Uh, I think what is very important for us is uh, what you mentioned before, you know, keep the talents, um, attract the, the, the talents. What they like a lot on our platform is that we have this open platform so um, we don't use private banking as a distribution channel, and that's very attractive for clients, but it's also very attractive for our, our people. What's the potential in Asia? The, uh, I see great potential. Uh, for example, um, you know, China, um, we obviously serve from Hong Kong and from Singapore across border, but it's something we always look at, you know, are there opportunities, possibilities to go onshore, to partner with uh, somebody? There are, um, are, are there talks right now? Look, we, we always look around. Maybe you know that we, had a, we have a strategic uh, um, cooperation agreement with, with Bank of China. Uh, we look at other uh, opportunities and possibilities uh, as well. Look, the, the main markets for us in, in Asia is uh, China, Singapore, Hong Kong, Indonesia and India. But also smaller markets um, or growing markets uh, like Thailand or uh, uh, or mature markets like Japan are interesting for us, and I see quite some potential. So do you see more hiring to come over the next 12, 24 months, and where might that be? We'll continue to hire. We have hired in Asia substantially last year. Quantify you know, that for us. I mean, how, how many more do you expect to, to hire? We, um, I, I mentioned at the beginning of the year that roughly 50 to 70 relationship managers on a net basis um, and, of course, we always look at opportunities, you know, M&A or joint ventures, and we have done some of them last year. And in Asia, we did these uh, joint ventures with uh, Nomura and with uh, Siam Commercial Bank. Uh, we talk about how there's so much potential in China, and China is also opening up. Your views on the inclusion of uh, China bonds in the Bloomberg Barclays Index, what potential do you see there? And is that a game changer for China and for investors? I think it would definitely be a game changer, you know, if, if that happens. And uh, the probability is a bit difficult to judge. Uh, uh, but um, I think it would certainly add, you know, liquidity. And I think it would be a great opportunity. Are you concerned about the slowdown in China? Some say that perhaps in the fourth quarter, despite the numbers that we saw, China didn't grow at all and hence the need for Xi Jinping to jump in and attend the meetings to ensure mm. that the economy goes back on track. Mm. I mean, what, what we have seen, and we, um, I'm sure you saw the numbers uh, this morning, is that the first quarter actually went quite well. Um, I, I think they went from more reform-driven strategy to um, a growth uh, strategy. Uh, it's a bit credit-led, uh, I, I, I have to say. So the question is, how sustainable is, is that? Um, I think it's very important, you know, that they find a solution with the U.S. Um, and these talks uh, will, will go on. Uh, but um, if we look at the global economy, we're slightly optimistic and we don't see a recession this year. Bernard, before we let you go, we've gone around the world anyways. Let's touch on Brexit. That's uncertainty remains. How concerned are you about your business uh, over there? We have a, um, quite a sizable organization mm -hmm. in, in London uh, where we cover uh, the, the UK clients. We are not concerned because we don't export services from the UK to Europe. Not, not like the investment banks that have... Um, that have the resources, the services, the products in London, and they export it to continental Europe. So what we do is we serve UK clients, domestic clients, and uh, but that resident impacts London sentiment, clients. Though. It impacts uh, sentiment. Um, so we have invested quite substantially last year. Uh, and uh, you have to know that UK is the sixth largest um, ultra high net worth, uh, high net worth market in, in the world. Um, so, you know, I still, um, um, don't believe or think is a low probability that we see a, a hard Brexit. But of course, what you saw yesterday, uh, again, um, you know, in the parliament is a bit uh, concerning.